Passing through a small pantry, you emerge within a rather large living room, furnished and decorated as you would expect for an older magic user. After wizard locking the door again, the ultimate joins you, turns and finally lowers his hood, revealing a middle-aged man with deeply recessed eyes, lips stained with the consumption of nemfrut over decades of time and a stench you can barely endure. Equally as interested in you, the man looks all of you over more carefully, still trying to determine who you are and why you're here. Let's do a wisdom check on your hero to see what your first impression of the man may be. Needing a 14 or less from Janet, a 14 was rolled. Success, given the magic he has already used, the ultimate must be at least 7th level and likely higher. The man appears foreboding and suspicious, but he has brought you to his presumed home and you sense that he's not here to harm you. I've just saved all of you, so you will be honest and show me proper respect, the Chagarayan begins, his own voice authoritative yet respectful as well. Who are you, who do you work for and why are you here? Your first important interaction with the ultimate, how do you respond, choose an option, charisma, we're here to liberate Chagaria. Intelligence, to destroy the nemesis plants, wisdom, to appease the inner circle? Attempting to intellectually impress the ultimate, you explain that you've come to try and destroy the one plant so that the number of nemesis plants can be curtailed throughout Chagaria and its drug populace weaned off the substance and potentially saved. And you thought you could do that on your own? The ultimate returns, not impressed. And who are you? Ariana questions, her elven innocence helping to break the ice here. The ultimate turns to Ariana and steps toward her as if she were suddenly the focus of conversation here. Before I answer, I need to know everything about all of you. Young elf, let me probe your mind so I can know for myself whether you are a friend or foe. Ariana looks to you, doubt in her slender eyes. How do you react to the question, choose an option, agree with a nod, disagree with a nod, order the ultimate to back away? The tolerance score for Janet remains the same, meeting Ariana's stare, you nod yes, encouraging the ultimate to continue. Ariana then turns back to the approaching magic user and agrees, allowing him to place his hands over her forehead. Then, just as Representative Margaret did to you back in Tobin just after her near assassination, the Chagarayan uses his magic to dive deep into Ariana's mind, quickly extracting everything that he wants to know. Moments pass, and Ariana begins to show obvious distress from the mind reading. As you recall, the technique can be quite painful, and you recognize that she can't take much more of the probing. Just as you're about to intervene, the ultimate lets go of Ariana and takes a step back, the young elf catching her breath. The man looks to her again and sighs, his words surprisingly compassionate. Forgive me, but I had to know I could trust you. And I am sorry about your brother. Ariana stands straight again and nods, the momentary ordeal over. The man then turns back to you, his demeanor much softer. You can call me Slyvan, the ultimate continues, addressing your entire party. I've lived here for many years as an ultimate. And if we're all being honest, I am a spy, for the inner circle. Undoing the polymorph self spell that was affecting his physical appearance, Slyvan reverts back into a much healthier and somewhat more handsome version of himself, revealing his true form. While most in your party are pleasantly surprised, Eswin quickly becomes defensive and draws his weapon. A circle spy? Eswin cries, upset. Do you intend to turn us over to the circle? We won't go quietly. Let's do a quick wisdom check on your hero to see if you can gauge Slyvan's intentions here. Needing a 14 or less from Janet, a 16 was rolled. Failure, concerned as well, your immediate thought is that you might be in danger, as you're not sure you can trust the magic user here. Stand down, warrior, Slyvan gently orders, backing away a step. I have no direct orders to hand you to anyone. Eswin looks to you, then back to Slyvan, slowly putting his weapon away again. But now that you know who we are, what are your intentions? Kartha wisely asks. The false ultimate turns to Kartha and stares at her for several long moments, 
thinking upon a proper response. Not even I know the whereabouts of the one plant, Slyvan finally continues. But there are some dwarven ruins a few days march due east from here into the mountains. The clan there was founded long before the Ultimates took power here in Chagaria and they gathered all the information they could on the Ultimates as they grew in power. The dwarves were finally destroyed by the Ultimates a few decades ago, but it's possible their ruins still contain secrets that can help you discover the location of the one plant. Go on, Kartha asks, the suggestion intriguing. The dwarves were strong and very proud, and didn't see the Ultimates as a genuine threat, Slyvan continues, recalling all he knows. But somehow the Ultimates released a magical poison into their underground fortress, a substance that sapped their will and turned them all into powerful undead. If you go there, not only will you have to deal with the undead dwarves but the lingering poison as well. Undead and poison? Eswin laments. We can deal with the undead, but the poison? The middle-aged wizard ponders for a moment, then has an idea and steps over to a nearby chest. Opening it with a few magical words, Slyvan extracts an emerald-based amulet from the chest, returning to your party moments later. This is an amulet of slow poison, which should help protect all of you within the ruins, the circle spy instructs, handing the magical item to you. You'll still take poison damage but it will be minimal. Just stay together, find what you need and escape as quickly as you can. Acknowledging Slyvan's gift, you place the amulet around your neck. Let me be clear, Slyvan continues, providing some final advice. You won't be able to rest within the ruins, and even with the amulet, the poison will eventually wear you down. Therefore, don't fight everything you encounter, or you will never escape. I know these ruins sound difficult, but it's probably the best chance you have of finding the location of the one plant. What say all of you? Slyvan is asking about your intentions, how do you respond, choose an option, we agree, we will explore these ruins, we agree, but can you come with us? We disagree, it sounds too dangerous. No, I have something else to do, the circle spy responds, shaking his head. Then I am off, Slyvan informs your party. You left quite the mess back in Oalats, I need to go back and clean things up. Feel free to camp here, and when you're ready, head due east into the mountains, the dwarven ruins won't be hard to find. And for the love of Sisla, be careful. Your party acknowledges the advice of Slyvan and you watch as he approaches, embracing you a moment later. Surprised by the gesture, you awkwardly place an arm around him as well. In that moment, let's do a curiosity check on your hero and see what happens. Needing a 15 or less from Janet, a 19 was rolled. Failure, no, you don't notice anything more. The embrace sure seemed awkward, however. The circle spy nods to you one more time, then casts his dimension door spell again to teleport back to the village, leaving you alone within his home to contemplate and prepare. GM note, your quest log has been updated. Click the quests button for all the details, secure within the home of Slyvan, take all the time you need to heal, memorize spells, and prepare for the journey ahead. Given that you will likely be unable to rest and recover once you enter the Dwarven Ruins, be sure you're fully provisioned with food and water before you depart as well. Slyvan likely has some supplies stored away somewhere. The cabinets have been locked. In an open, watched place like this, you have no opportunity to try and pick or bash anything and so you leave it alone. A quick search finds that the unlocked cabinets have 150 rations, 5 scrolls of restoration and 6 potions of moderate healing.
Janet nods and takes the five scrolls of restoration. Barthol nods and takes the six potions of moderate healing. A quick search finds that the well has 150 water skins. A simple painting hangs on the wall here, and is rather pleasant and serene. Janet casts Cure Light Wounds on Barthol, healing. Janet casts Cure Moderate Wounds on St. Aetius, healing him for 16. Kartha casts Cure Light Wounds on Redfern, healing him for 12 hit points. Kartha casts Cure Light Wounds on Barthol, healing him for 11 hit points. St. Aetius casts Cure Light Wounds on himself, healing him for 11 hit points. Your party rests and recovers for 8 hours. Wounds are tended, spells are memorized and your heroes are refreshed and re-energized. Janet casts Cure Light Wounds on Eswin, healing him for 4 hit points. Janet casts Cure Moderate Wounds on Kartha, healing her for 13 hit points. Kartha casts Cure Light Wounds on Redfern, healing him for 5 hit points. Kartha casts Cure Light Wounds on St. Aetius, healing him for 9 hit points. Your party rests and recovers for 8 hours. Wounds are tended, spells are memorized and your heroes are refreshed and re-energized. Area number 3, hidden home of Sliven, a smaller home tucked away into a small hill just south of Oalats, it appears ordinary and nondescript. Travel alert, using the trail, you travel east, taking two days to arrive, reaching the base of the mountains here in central Chagaria, you soon find a path leading up, likely created by the dwarves you're seeking. As Sliven suggested, the path leads almost due east. As you climb, you soon notice what appears to be a large white dragon circling overhead, it likely hasn't spotted you yet, but its sight is disconcerting. Of course you push on, about to spend another 12 hours or so along the path. The stony path eventually leads you to the outskirts of a destroyed castle, its primary gate blasted, several of the stone walls breached and most of the wooden structures within the primary walls of the castle burned down and ruined. Whatever happened here, you sense that the defenders of the castle lost the battle, were soon rooted and, likely, slaughtered. As you cautiously approach, you soon notice a green haze hanging over much of the ruins, likely emanating from the center of the wrecked castle. Let's do a party intelligence check to see if you can determine what's going on with this green mist. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 2 was rolled. Success, the mist here is likely the poison that Sliven warned us about, Redfern comments. Once we enter the ruins, we will slowly start taking damage. Scanning the ruins for a way in, you hear something immense flying about close by. 
The large white dragon you saw half a day earlier then glides down and lands atop one of the castle's destroyed parapets, eyeing you as an owl would eye mice. The beast looks large and very old, with several scars across its face and wings. Hence, you suspect the dragon has seen its glory days and, hopefully, is not here to attack. How do you handle this unexpected encounter, choose an option, curiosity, ask the creature its name, diplomacy, ask the creature to converse, spirit, ask the creature if it needs help. White Dragon, do you need any assistance? Redfern asks, calling out to the beast. The creature just stares at you, however, unable or unwilling to answer. The dragon then lifts itself forward and lands just 20 feet away, the beast easily able to deploy its breath weapon if it wants to. The creature sniffs the air in your direction, then roars with what seems like anger. The situation is getting tense. What do you do next, choose an option, attack the dragon and put it down, offer food to the dragon, remain still and see what happens. The beast sniffs the food, tries some of it, then begins to devour the rations you've thrown to the monster. It's clearly very hungry, yet has not attempted to attack. Awkward minutes pass as the dragon consumes all the rations you've provided, eyeing you warily but definitely preferring your food to any sort of attack. Let's do a party wisdom check here to see if you notice anything further. Needing a 13 or less from your heroes, a 1 was rolled. Success, Janet, if I didn't know any better, Kartha begins, continuing to observe the dragon, I would say this beast has been tamed by someone. The dwarves, perhaps? Ariana asks, a likely scenario. The dragon finishes the rations and looks to you again before stepping away. Continuing to watch the white beast, it then leaps back upon the parapet and, without warning, unleashes its icy breath weapon upon the interior of the destroyed ruins. The monster looks to your party and nods, then takes to the air and is soon gone. Well done in recognizing that the mighty, and, perhaps, tamed dragon was simply hungry. Let's reward your empathy with some bonus experience. Each hero earns 250 experience points. Looking beyond the ruined walls, you see what appears to be a single ladder leading down into the darkness. Just as importantly, however, the icy breath weapon of the dragon has frozen the greenish mist here, it shouldn't be a threat as you descend into the dungeon. The ladder leading down through the frozen greenish fog appears to be your only way forward. Travel alert, using the ladder, you travel down, taking a minute to arrive, climbing down the old, rickety wooden ladder into the darkness, you soon arrive within the Dwarven Castle's lower level entry chamber, which, you presume, will take you into the bowels of the ruins. Looking about, you can see that the chamber has been heavily damaged from above, to the point where you fear its collapse may be imminent. Worse, a haze of poisonous gas clings to the floor, you're not entirely sure what the poison might do to you, but there is little you can do to avoid breathing some of it. Standing there, let's do a party empathy check and see what happens. Needing a 12 or less from your heroes, a 11 was rolled. Success, I sense great sorrow here, Kartha whispers, looking about. It's as if the dwarves are all calling out in horror. I feel it too, Ariana adds, frightened. Something terrible happened here. The last to descend the rotting wooden ladder, one of the steps suddenly breaks and Sainadiers falls a few feet, not far enough to hurt him but causing a commotion and churning up some of the gaseous poison clinging to the floor. Spread out, let's take a look around, S. Win orders, intent on searching the small chamber for clues. The smaller 20 by 20 chamber is mostly empty, several old and rotting weapon racks are here, a few worthless battle axes still secured within them. There are also half a dozen or so dwarven skeletons lying about, all of them dressed in heavy armor. Naturally, you're not keen on inspecting the floor, lest you further expose yourselves to the gaseous poison there. 
let's do a party intelligence check and see if anyone notices anything more here. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 1 was rolled. Success, inspecting the skeletons a little more, it's fairly clear that they not only died here but were killed in mortal combat. Hence, you're pretty sure these brave souls gave their lives in defense of their stronghold. Having searched the entry chamber and found little, you look south where an open doorway leads into what appears to be a large hallway beyond. Suddenly, the ceiling begins to rumble and Eswin orders everyone to stand in place. The rumbling intensifies and some dust precipitates from the ceiling, it feels as if the ceiling is about to collapse. The rumbling continues for a few more moments and then stops, the worst seems to be over. These ruins are unsound, Ariana comments. We can't stay here. What is that? Eswin whispers, pointing toward the doorway to the south. Materializing in the near darkness is some sort of apparition, like a wraith but appearing very much like a ghostly dwarven soldier. Its appearance sends a cold shiver down your spine, it's likely undead but something you haven't encountered before. Dear Sisla, St. Adiers utters, horrified by the apparition. Is that... a specter? Kartha cries out, finishing his sentence. It's returned from the dead to finish what it started here. Indeed, you can see upon the ghostly being horrific wounds, as if the monster had just risen from its place of death to again defend the castle. A second one then appears alongside the first, then a third. These monsters drain energy like a wraith, St. Adiers responds, his eyes filled with terror. They'll attempt to drain you with each hit, so watch out. Without making a sound, the specters lift their battle axes and rush your party, their eyes crazed with a murderous vengeance, these monsters have arrived to destroy all of you. Your party is under attack. Threatening all of you are three specters. It's Muriel Ev's turn. What do you want her to do? Needing a 35 or less on percentile dice, a 82 is rolled. Failure. Marialeth tries to blend into the shadows but is unsuccessful, remaining visible to all combatants. It's Kartha's turn. Kartha uses turn undead, but wasn't able to turn any of the encountered undead. It's Janet's turn. What? Janet uses turn undead, but wasn't able to turn any of the encountered undead. It's red. Redfern uses a wand of phantasmal force on Spectre number 2, horrifying it for 2 points of damage for 5 minutes. Ariana uses a boots of speed on herself, allowing herself to act twice each round for 5 minutes. It's C. Nyers's turn. What do- St. Ayers uses turn undead, but wasn't able to turn any of the encountered undead. Needing a 45 or less on percentile dice, a 41 is rolled. Success. Barthol blends into the shadows, it's Eswin's turn. What do you want him to do? Eswin uses a boots of speed on himself, allowing himself to act twice each round for 5 minutes. Spectre number 3 attacks Eswin with its touch needing a 21 to hit. Die roll is a 12, plus 6 to hit, Spectre number 3 misses Eswin. GM note, a new combat round has begun. Initiative is roll, Ariana readies her longsword plus 2 and swings at Spectre number 2, needing a 17 to hit. Eswin readies his longsword plus 2 and swings at Spectre number 3, needing a 17 to hit. Die roll is a 18, plus 8 to hit, Eswin, Barthol readies his short sword plus 1 and swings at Spectre number 3, needing a 13 to hit, plus 4 due to hiding in shadows. Die roll is a 16, St. Aetius readies his mace plus 1 and swings at Spectre number 2, needing a 17 to hit. It's Redfern's turn. What do you want him to do? Redfern readies his quarter staff plus one and swings at Spectre number two, needing a 17 to hit. Needing a 35 or less on percentile dice, a 95 is rolled. It's Ariana's turn. What do you want her to do? Ariana readies her longsword plus two and swings at Spectre number two, needing a 17 to hit. Eswin readies his longsword plus two and swings at Spectre number one, needing a 17 to hit. 
Kartha readies her mace plus one and swings at Spectre number two, needing a 17 to hit. Redfern directs his phantasmal force at Spectre number one. Hora, GM note, a new combat round has begun. Initiative is rolled, with higher values acting first. GM alert, the perpetual poison affecting this location again damages your party. Ariana readies her longsword plus two and swings at Spectre number one, needing a 17 to hit. Die roll is a 19, plus seven to hit. Ariana hits Spectre number one, doing six points of damage and defeating it. Well done. All combatants have been defeated, ending the battle. Each hero receives 229 experience points. The Dwarven Spectres lose the last of their hit points and fade from existence, never to harm another living soul. What wretched monsters! Eswin complains as he catches his breath. Pitiful ones, Kartha responds, saddened as well. The dwarves here died violent, unholy deaths. I fear we will encounter more of these monsters. A moment later, the ceiling begins to rumble again. This time, however, actual stone begins to fall, the ceiling appears to be collapsing. Recognizing the danger, Eswin orders all of you to run south into the hallway beyond, lest the party be destroyed within the chamber's collapse. Racing into this long hallway, your heroes just manage to outrun the collapsing entry chamber to the north, its destruction throwing large amounts of dust and debris into the air behind you. Worse, you are now completely cut off, you certainly won't be exiting the ruins the same way that you entered them. Everyone alright? Redfern asks, holding a handkerchief up to his mouth to avoid breathing any more of the debris cloud raised by the chamber's collapse. Glancing about and noting that everyone appears to be safe, you breathe a poisoned sigh of relief, lucky that everyone in your party is still alive. You now stand at the northern end of what appears to be a grand hallway leading north to south. At one time the hallway was luxurious and grand, a testament to the proud and noble dwarves who lived here. Now, however, the corridor is a ghost of itself, dark and dusty and damaged. We should do a quick search and make sure the way is safe, Eswin suggests. Looking about, you find little here, apart from a few more dwarven skeletons who apparently met their demise defending the hallway. Hence, the immediate area appears empty and devoid of threats. Your party stands at an intersection, not only does the grand hallway lead south but smaller corridors lead away into the shadows to the west and east. Hence, while you can't return the way you came to the north, you do have options here. Your party searches for traps but don't find any. Travel alert, using the hallway, you travel east, taking a few minutes to arrive, following the smaller hallway east, you quickly reach a point where the ceiling has completely given way, the resulting cave in making further travel to the east impossible. Unfortunately, it appears you've reached an empty dead end. Giving the area a quick search, you soon discover some humanoid feet protruding from beneath the rocks and debris, an apparent victim of the ceiling's collapse here. Moving the larger rocks and such aside, you're soon able to pull the corpse out of the debris and give it a good search. You've found a female human thief, deceased for some time. While she does not appear to possess anything of value, you do find a small, blood-stained diary which may contain some useful information. Janet. Let's do a tolerance check on your hero to see if you have the patience to meticulously study the diary and discern any secrets within. Needing a 17 or less from Janet, a 1 was rolled. Success, while the dried blood has ruined most of the diary, an hour of study reveals that the thief had come to the ruins in search of treasure, only to find it haunted by the undead. Her notes include reference to the Dwarven King in his palace room far to the southeast and his presumed treasure that lies beyond, but that's about all you can discern. The area all but empty, your only recourse is to head back west. Travel alert, using the hallway, you travel west, taking a few minutes to arrive, 
your party stands at an intersection. Travel alert, using the hallway, you travel west, taking a few minutes to arrive. Nearing this small antechamber, it appears you're entering a dwarven washroom, complete with a crude commode, wash basin, and a dresser. An opulent mirror hangs on the far wall opposite you. As you approach, you eye what looks like a dwarven woman and perhaps her younger sister step into the washroom, their backs to you and seemingly unaware of your presence. They don't appear to be spirits or anything undead, just normal dwarves dressed as princesses. Let's do a party curiosity check here to see if you notice anything more. Needing a 11 or less from your heroes, a 16 was rolled. Failure, sorry, but nobody notices anything here. It appears you're simply approaching two normal dwarves. A moment later, the two dwarves hear your approach, turn around and start to snarl, not welcoming you whatsoever. The hissing growls are not unlike an ill-tempered feral cat warning you to turn and leave at once lest you be attacked. They don't look like normal dwarves. S. Wing comments, readying his weapon. Agreed. Kartha replies, sensing something evil and monstrous about them. Not sure what they are, but I don't think they're mortal. A moment later, the dwarven women leap forward, attacking with an unnatural ferocity. Your party is under attack. Menacing your entire party are four vampire spawns. It's Redfern's turn. What do you want him to do? Redfern uses a wand of phantasmal force on vampire spawn number 3, nearly horrifying her, needing a 15 or greater, vampire spawn number 3 rolls a 17 and saves for no damage versus spells, needing a 45 or less on percentile dice, a 47 is rolled, failure, needing a 35 or less on percentile dice, a 44 is rolled, failure, vampire spawn number 3 attacks Ariana with her bite needing a 22 to hit, Vampire spawn number 4 attacks Eswin with her bite needing a 21 to hit. Die roll is a 19, plus 4 to hit, vampire spawn number 4 hits Eswin, nearly level draining him permanently, needing a 6 or greater, Eswin rolls a 13 and saves versus death ray or poison. Vampire spawn number 4 further damages Eswin, biting him for 13 points of damage and leaving Eswin with 24 hit points. Also. The monster has attached itself to Eswin and will automatically hit now with each subsequent round until defeated. It's Janet's turn. What do you want her to do? Janet uses a blink dog on vampire spawn number 4, biting her for 2 points of damage for a half hour. It's Ariana's turn. What do you want her to do? Ariana uses a boots of speed on herself, allowing herself to act twice each round for 5 minutes. It's Kartha's turn. What do you want her to do? Kartha uses turn undead, but wasn't able to turn any of the encountered undead. Sainadius uses turn undead, but wasn't able to turn any of the encountered undead. Eswin uses a boots of speed on himself, allowing himself to act twice each round for 5 minutes. Vamp, GM note, a new combat round has begun. Initiative is rolled, with higher values acting first, it's Ariana's turn. Ariana readies her longsword plus 2 and swings at vampire spawn number 3, needing a 15 to hit. Eswin readies his longsword plus 2 and swings at vampire spawn number 4, needing a 15 to hit. Die roll is a 3, plus 8 to hit, Eswin misses vampire spawn number 4. Needing a 35 or less on percentile dice, a 75 is rolled. Failure. Mary Aleth tr Redfern readies his quarter staff plus one and swings at vampire spawn number three, needing a 15 to hit. Die roll is a six, 
plus 4 to hit, Redfern misses vampire spawn number 3. It's Karthus turn. What do you want? Kartha casts spiritual hammer on vampire spawn number 3, bashing her for 6 points of damage for 5 minutes. Vampire spawn number 3 has been defeated. It's Janet's blink dog's turn. What do you want it to do? Janet directs her blink dog at vampire spawn number 4, biting her for 4 points of damage and leaving her with 20 hit points. It's Ariana's turn. What do you want her to do? Ariana readies her longsword plus 2 and swings at vampire spawn number 1. Needing a swin readies his longsword plus 2 and swings at vampire spawn number 4, needing a 15 to hit. Die roll it, Janet readies her mace plus 2 and swings at vampire spawn number 4, needing a 15 to hit. Sainaeus readies his mace plus 1 and swings at vampire spawn number 4, needing a 15 to hit. Die roll is a 6, plus 5 to hit, Sainaeus misses vampire spawn number 4. Vampire spawn number 4 attacks a swin with her bite and automatically hits, nearly level draining him permanently, Needing a 6 or greater, Eswin rolls a 13 and saves versus death ray or poison. Vampire spawn number 4 further damages Eswin, biting him for 8 points of damage and leaving Eswin with 16 hit points. In addition, the vampire spawn number 4 regenerates 8 lost hit points from the attack and now has 11 hit points. It's Bart Hall's turn. What do you want him to do? Barth readies his short sword plus one and swings at vampire spawn number four, needing a GM note, a new combat round has begun. Initiative is rolled, Ariana readies her longsword plus two and swings at vampire spawn number one. Eswin readies his longsword plus two and swings at vampire spawn number four, need Marialeth casts magic missile on vampire spawn number four, striking her with a magic missile for five points of damage. Vampire spawn number 4 has been defeated. It's Janet's blink dog's turn. Janet directs her blink dog at vampire spawn number 1, biting her for 1 point of damage and leaving her with 12. Barth readies his short sword plus 1 and swings at vampire spawn number 1, needing a 15 to hit. Sainaeus readies his mace plus 1 and swings at vampire spawn number 1, needing a 15. Kartha readies her mace plus 1 and swings at vampire spawn number 2. Ariana readies her longsword plus 2 and swings at vampire spawn number 2 needing a 15 to hit. Redfern readies his quarter staff plus 1 and swings at vampire spawn number 2, needing a 15 to hit. Die roll is a 11, plus 4 to hit, Redfern hits vampire spawn number 2, doing 7 points of damage and defeating her. Well done. All combatants have been defeated, ending the battle. Each hero receives 175 experience points. The vampiric monsters are put down. Finding some wooden debris nearby, Sainaeus and Kartha then drive wooden stakes through their hearts, destroying the monsters forever. First the specters, and now these vampires, Redfern comments, worried for the party. I fear these ruins are infested with very powerful undead. I believe these were just vampire spawn, Kartha responds, unnerved. That likely means that an even more powerful vampire dwells here, he or she will be even harder to destroy. Looking about, you wonder how you can better prepare your party to find these deadly vampires. Recognizing the mirror here as a potential tool, you use your weapon to smash into it, glassy shards falling into the wash basin and floor as your heroes initially watch in confusion. You then grab one of the remaining shards still attached to the mirror and wrap one of your bandages around it so that its sharp edges won't cut you. Of course. Sainaeus nods, approving of what you're doing. Vampires don't leave a reflection in a mirror. With little else to do here, you can either travel east back toward the grand hallway beyond or head south into what looks to be a royal bedroom. Barthol has a 50% chance of picking the lock and rolls 88 on percentile dice. Failure, the cabinet remains. Janet nods and takes the three Electrum pieces. You spend about a minute searching the area. However, you don't find any secret doors or exits. 
There is nothing hidden here, either. Your party... Travel alert, using the hallway, you travel south, taking a few minutes to arrive, entering what was once a regal and impressive dwarven woman's bedroom, the area is now crumbling with rotting debris strewn everywhere amidst a large, unkempt bed, couch, dressers and a small chest. Resting on the floor in one corner are two wooden coffins, sized for an adult dwarf and perhaps a smaller child. Two additional coffins lie on the floor in the opposite corner. The chamber is fairly large, and with all the debris lying about, might take some time to thoroughly search. A thorough search reveals a few things. First, all of the coffins are empty but contain a thin layer of soil that has been disturbed recently, meaning that the coffins likely contained corpses. Second, while all the furniture is rotting and useless, the small chest is locked and not easily opened. Finally, you notice a fine brown powder covering just about everything. Let's do a party intelligence check to see if you can determine what the powder may be. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 6 was rolled. Success, don't touch the powder, Redfern warns after closely examining it himself. It's brown mold, and highly toxic. We should leave this chamber at once. The crumbling bedroom remains cold and quiet. Hallways exit to the north and east. Watch out! Marioleth warns. The small chest here has a poison needle trap. Barthol has a 45% chance of disarming traps and rolls a 71 on percentile dice. Failure, the poison needle trap here on the small chest remains a threat to the party. Marioleth has a 35% chance of disarming traps and rolls a 85, the party disturbs the brown mold growing on the small chest. The entire party is targeted, mildly poisoning them, Janet is harmed for 2 points of damage, needing a 8 or greater, Janet rolls a 4 and fails versus death ray or poison, Ariana is harmed for 2 points of damage, needing a 7 or greater, Ariana rolls a 5 and fails versus death. Barthol nods and takes the light crossbow plus two. Janet casts Cure Moderate Wounds on Eswin, healing him for 14 hit points. Travel Alert, using the hallway, you travel east, taking a few minutes to arrive, standing about midway within the grand hallway, you've reached another intersection, with smaller corridors leading away to the west and east while the main hallway continues to the north and south. From your vantage point, you can see a faint reddish glow to the south where, you believe, another intersection lies. Beyond that, however, you see nothing more here. While there is little to examine here, your party decides to search the intersection anyway to see what you may find. Hence, you're surprised when Ariana pulls something from the dust and broken stone. Holding the item up into your light, Ariana has found some sort of delicate dwarven pendant, a beautiful silver chain containing a moderately sized ruby shaped like a heart. The jewelry looks expensive and you allow Ariana to keep it, given that it was she who found it. The midway section of the grand hallway reached and explored, it's time to move on. Smaller corridors lead away to the west and east while the main hallway here leads south and back to the north. Travel alert, using the hallway, you travel east, taking a few minutes to arrive, this chamber was likely a small study at one time, 
containing a variety of comfortable chairs, small tables, and bookshelves, all of which have been violently ransacked and thrown about as if a tornado had passed through. Hundreds of old books lie about as well, rotting in the moist, poisonous air. Searching the small study, you don't find anything of significance or value. Hoping to at least find some information amongst the books, they are all too damaged to yield any secrets. So, unfortunately, the chamber appears to be a waste of time. Still, let's do a party curiosity check to see if anyone discovers anything more here. Needing a 11 or less from your heroes, a 20 was rolled. Failure, out of the corner of your eye you suddenly detect movement in the dark shadows along the far eastern wall. Something black and viscous then leaps out toward the party, surprising all of you and landing an initial attack. Your party is under attack. Eyeing the entire party is one black pudding. Black pudding attacks Ariana with its pseudopod needing a 22 to hit. Die roll is a 19, plus 9 to hit, black pudding hits Ariana, engulfing her for a few minutes, needing a 8 or greater, Ariana rolls a 5 and fails versus paralysis or petrify. Black pudding further damages Ariana, crushing her for 10 points of damage and leaving Ariana with 30 hit points. It's Janet's turn. What do you want her to do? Janet uses a blink dog on black pudding, biting it for one point of damage for a half hour. It's Red Fern's turn. What do you want him to do? Red Fern casts Phantasmal Force on black pudding, nearly horrifying it, needing a 13 or greater, black pudding rolls a 18 and saves for no damage versus spells. It's Bart Hall's turn. Barth readies his short sword plus one and swings at black pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Die roll is... St. Aegis casts cause moderate wounds on black pudding, nearly wounding it, needing a 13 or greater, black pudding rolls a 19 and saves for no damage ver... Swin uses a boots of speed on himself, allowing himself to act twice each round for 5 minutes. Kartha readies her mace plus 1 and swings at black pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Die roll is a 14, plus 5 to hit, Kartha hits black pudding, GM note, a new combat round has begun. Initiative is rolled, with higher values acting first, GM alert, be careful here, Janet. Mary Oleth casts Phantasmal Force on Black Pudding, horrifying it for 5 points of damage for 5 minutes, needing a 13 or greater, Black Pudding rolls a 7 and fails versus spells. It's Eswin's turn. What do you want him to do? Eswin readies his longsword plus 2 and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Die roll is a 16, plus 8 to hit, Eswin hits Black Pudding. Mary Oleth readies her longsword plus 1 and swings at Black Pudding. Kartha readies her mace plus 1 and swings at Black Pudding, needing. Janet directs her blink dog at Black Pudding, biting it for 6 points of damage and leaving it with 33 hit points. It's Janet's turn. What do you want her to do? Janet readies her mace plus 2 and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Red Fern readies his quarter staff plus 1 and swings at Black Pudding, need- St. Aegis readies his mace plus 1 and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Eswin uses a boots of speed on himself, 
allowing himself to act twice each round for five minutes. Black, it's Barthal's turn. What do you want him to do? Barthal readies his short sword plus one and swings at Black Pudding, needing a GM note, a new combat round has begun. Initiative is rolled. Eswin readies his long sword plus two and swings at Black Pudding, needing a four. Marialeth readies her long sword plus one and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Janet directs her blink dog at Black Pudding, biting it for three points. Marialeth directs her phantasmal force at Black Pudding, horrifying it. Barthal readies his short sword plus one and swings at Black Pudding. Redfern readies his quarter staff plus one and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Sainadiers readies his mace plus one and swings at Eswin readies his long sword plus two and swings at Black Pudding. Janet readies her mace plus two and swings at Black Pudding. Neat Kartha readies her mace plus one and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Die roll is a 17, plus five to hit. Kartha hits Black Pudding, doing one point of damage. Black GM note, a new combat round has begun. Marialeth readies her longsword plus one and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 14. Janet readies her mace plus two and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 4. Ariana readies her longsword plus two and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Redfern readies his quarter staff plus one and swings at Black Pudding. Marialeth directs her phantasmal force at Black Pudding, horrifying it for four points. Arthal readies his short sword plus one and swings at Black Pudding. Sainadiers readies his mace plus one and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Die roll is a 11, plus, it's Kartha's turn. What do you want her to do? Kartha readies her mace plus one and swings at Black Pudding, needing a 14 to hit. Janet directs her blink dog at Black Pudding, biting it for six points of damage and defeating it. Well done. All combatants have been defeated, ending the battle. Each hero receives 174 experience points. Your heroes are finally able to defeat the Black Pudding, finishing it off with some well-directed fire. Nicely done. Look. Ariana points toward the eastern wall. That pudding monster was concealing a surviving bookshelf. Sure enough, a small bookshelf containing several dozen old tomes still stands against the wall, damaged from decades of wear and neglect but readable nonetheless. These books may yield the clues we've come here for, Redfern announces, stepping over to the bookshelf. Let's spend some time going through them. Your party in agreement, you spend the next several hours going through all the books. Let's do a party intelligence check to see what you discover. Needing a 14 or less from your heroes, a 3 was rolled. Success, the books generally tell the story of how the dwarves here all but ruled central Chagaria for centuries, long before the ultimates came to power. Over time, the dwarves continued to scoff at the growing power of the ultimates, mocking them and refusing to show any respect. Once the ultimates came to power and seized all Chagaria for themselves, the dwarves still refused to even acknowledge them, convinced they were not a threat. So the dwarves here refused to honor or even acknowledge the ultimates, Eswin paraphrases, beginning to understand. And that arrogance got them all killed. The ultimates would not suffer such disrespect, Redfern responds with a heavy heart. The dwarves here were likely more powerful for a time, but the potency of the Nemfrit can be quite strong. Eventually, the ultimates became powerful enough to not just challenge the dwarves but defeat them, and in being disrespected, they showed the dwarves no mercy. Turning at least some of them into undead in the process, Sainadius adds, appalled. These dwarves need to be avenged. The small study now thoroughly searched and interacted with, it's time to move on. Of course, your only option is to retreat west again toward the Grand Hall some 70 feet away. Barthol has a 50% chance of picking the lock and rolls a 20 on percentile dice. Success. The cabinet is unlocked and now easily opened. Unfortunately, the cabinet has nothing of value. Barthol has a 50% chance of picking the lock and rolls a 60 on percentile dice. Failure, the desk remains locked and impassable to the party. Marialeth has a 40% chance of picking the lock and rolls a 84 on percentile dice. Your heroes bash open the desk, destroying the locking mechanism and making it. Travel alert, 
using the hallway, you travel west, taking a few minutes to arrive, the midway section of the grand hallway reached and explored, it's time to move on. Travel alert, using the hallway, you travel south, taking 5 minutes to arrive, reaching the far southern end of the grand hallway, you now stand before a large stone door, a reddish aura glowing all around the door. In addition to the door, smaller corridors lead away to the west and east. Is it locked? Kartha asks, nodding toward the door. Eswin tries the door, recognizing that the door is extremely hot, something beyond has made the stone of the door almost scalding to the touch. Janet casts Cure Light Wounds on Ariana, healing her for 9 hit points. Kartha casts Cure Light Wounds on Eswin, healing him for 11 hit points. Conducting a quick search of the intersection here, you don't find anything helpful, other than the door leading south and the two corridors leading away to the west and east, there is simply nothing else here. The southern door seems unlocked, but the door itself is very hot to the touch. Hence, something even hotter must lie on the other side. At this point, you can either investigate the source of the heat to the south or try one of the dark passages leading away to the west and east. Of course, you can return north as well. Travel alert, using the doorway, you travel south, taking a few moments to arrive, pushing the heavy stone door aside, strong heat from beyond strikes you like a slap in the face. Immediately before you is a massive magma chamber, molten rock swirling below perhaps 50 feet down. It appears that a vein of magma has pushed itself up into the far southern end of the ruins, not only are you blocked from going any further south, but it looks like the entire ruin will soon be destroyed by the approaching magma. The way south blocked by the magma chamber, your only option is to return north back to the southern end of the grand hallway beyond. Travel alert, using the doorway, you travel north, taking a few moments to arrive, having investigated the source of the heat to the south, and recognizing it's a dead end, you can try one of the dark passages leading away to the west and east or return north again. Your party searches for traps but don't find any.